All right, glad to welcome in Jeremy Bloom. Everybody knows who you are. Good, sir. Thank you for coming on. We appreciate it. That's my pleasure. All right, so the Supreme Court comes out with this decision, and I just want to get your, your opening thoughts on the decision. It's not that athletes are going to get salaries yet. That's, that's going to come you know, down the line. Just sort of explain what this means for the modern-day athlete uh, for us. Well, I th first of all, it's, it's hard to get the Supreme Court to decide anything nine to zero. So, I mean, and that was the ruling from su the su Supreme Court. And, and basically what the, what the ruling did is up uphold the ninth district court in California's decision that the NCAA cannot cap educational related things for student athletes, like internships or, or like computers. And, you know, so, so this was just the, the beginning of what's to come. But really the, the, the big news out of the Supreme Court was Judge Kavanaugh's opinion after the Supreme Court adjourned that the NCAA's business model is in conflict of antitrust. And he basically opened the door for anybody to bring an antitrust case to the Supreme Court about amateurism. And he essentially gave his ruling in, in, in the court of public opinion. Um, so I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, it, tip of the iceberg, I think, is the great way to put it, what is your sort of opinion? This has kind of been a work in progress for, for a long time. You were obviously the start of, of sort of this whole, this whole motion here. So what, what sort of thoughts go through your mind when you, when you hear that this thing is now starting to gain some traction and we're actually getting somewhere? Well, I, I have dreamed of reading uh, what Judge Kavanaugh had, had said today for the past almost two decades, that, that, that student athletes are the product on the field, that if you remove them, all the revenue goes away that the NCAA is not, in fact, above the law, which I think anybody who's been fighting for student athlete rights has been saying for, for decades. So I was really encouraged to, to hear that. But in some ways, it, it didn't really matter what happened at the Supreme Court today because you have 10 states, including Texas and California, that have state laws that go into effect July 1st of this year, so just a few weeks, that is going to give student athletes the ability in those states to monetize their name, image, and likeness, which means they can sign endorsement deals. They can get paid for autograph signings. They own their name, which student athletes have never owned their name. The NCAA has owned their name. So amateurism as we know it is dead. It's over and we're never coming back. And so we all have to get ready and embrace this new chapter of college athletics where student athletes own their no own name, image, and likeness. But to your point, this is not universities needing to pay student athletes. This is simply student athletes owning their ability to monetize their name, image, and likeness. Mm -hmm. How would this have affected you back when, when you were playing and, and you were fighting for these issues? How would this affected you? Oh, this would have been a dream for me. I mean, this is, this is even more than what I was asking for. I, I, at the time, I was an Olympic skier. I was the number one ranked skier in the world. And I was a freshman on the football team. And I just wanted the NCAA to allow me to own, to own my own name, image, and likeness in skiing, not football. <laughs> but now, uh, in, in, in today's world, um, student athletes are going to be able to monetize their, their quote unquote amateur sport, which mine would have been football. So of course, you know, if I would have entered the system, you know, today I could have skied and, and played football and I would have been able to play my junior and senior season at the University of Colorado, which the NCAA stole from me and I'll never get those memories back. But my fight for, for, for this cause has always been much larger than myself. I've become one of the few people that student athletes reach out to when the NCAA does a, a great injustice to them. And so I have to not only live their experiences, but live mine over and over and over again for the past couple of decades. And there are thousands and thousands of student athletes who have just um, you know, gotten a really raw deal from the NCAA. And so I think today's a big day for, for all student athletes. Mm -hmm. What are what are sort of those conversations like when when athlete when student athletes come to you and and say what do we do how can we change this like, what, take me inside those conversations Well, Donald Delahoy was a scholarship kicker at UCF. He also happens to be a kid with a great personality, and so he had a YouTube channel. And the NCAA found out about his YouTube channel and kicked him out of school, took away his scholarship, his ability to play football, because the kid had a YouTube channel. I mean, what kind of world are we living in when, when an organization like the NCAA has the power to take someone's ability to play football away because they upload videos to YouTube? Um, you know, Brittany Collins is a tennis player at UMass who had an illegal phone jack in her dorm that the university was paying like $10 a month for. 
and they found out that she had a phone jack in her room and they they took away her her wins and losses and, and th these things are devastating to these young men and women i mean they've worked so hard for these opportunities and the ncaa has no right to do what what they've done um to donald to do what they've done to Brittany, or certainly do what they what they did to me um and and i just think that you know their their ability to be the judge the jury and the executioner and govern college athletics any way that they want that reign is over and and that feels really good yeah you said something a couple of minutes ago you know amateurism is kind of kind of dead as we know it it's it's in the past now there's a different there's going to be a different definition of that right what do you say to people that say athletes college athletes you know amateur athletes shouldn't shouldn't be getting these things they shouldn't be getting paid or, or whatever you know what, what do you say to those people I would say to those people that respectfully, it's not up to you to decide who gets to make money in this country. That's not that's not a right of a fan. So you know, fans say, "Well, I like college sports because they don't make money on the field." That may be your opinion, but you have no right to choose who makes money and who doesn't in this country. Um, and 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 I think if you flip the question on its head and said, "Well, do you get paid for for your skills? Where do you work? Do you get paid for what you do?" And, and of course, the answer is, is yes. But listen, reasonable people disagree with this. And the, the, the reason that, that, that they do is because there's been a lot of social conditioning and brainwashing around the term amateurism for decades inside of college athletics. And, and I think there's a big false narrative that they, that they create a pure existence for college athletics. But you know what? The Olympics overcame that purity when they changed their model from amateur to, to pro in the, in the early 90s. And thank goodness they did, because think about all the amazing memories that we would have been robbed by as fans. I mean, the dream team in the 90s, Michael Phelps, Apollo Ono, all, all, these, all these athletes would have never competed, been able to compete at the Olympic level if they were quote unquote amateur. Right. So the Olympics did it successfully. There's no doubt in my mind that the college sports will continue to thrive. It'll be more popular than ever. There's going to be more revenue than ever. P more people are going to care. And it's not going to break the, the sanctity of what people think that amateur amateurism brings to college athletics. Yeah. And you mentioned this is this has opened the door for discussions down the road about, you know, future possible athlete salaries and all that stuff. It, it, what would be the next step in terms of, of athletes getting you know a regular salary or, or sort of that that sort of thing? Where, where do we go from the, from here? Yeah, the, the first big step is name, image, and likeness because that collapses amateurism. So it's no so we don't talk about amateurism anymore because that that principle completely goes away. And so the next natural evolution of that conversation is well, all, you know, are these employees? And if they are employees, then they should get compensated for being on the field. There's also this false narrative for, for skeptical people who say, well, they get paid a scholarship. What a lot of those people don't understand is the NCAA does not pay for those scholarships, and most universities don't pay for them either. Scholarships are funded by an individual booster. Like I was on scholarship at the University of Colorado. Roy Durbin was my scholarship donor. He paid for my school. And, and so there's this false narrative. Well, they are getting paid by the NCAA and the school because they get a free ride. No, that's not the case. They, the, 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 their scholarships are paid for by, by individual um, people. There's also a false narrative going around that with name, image, and likeness, the non-revenue sports will go away because the university doesn't have enough money to pay for non-revenue sports. Name, image, and likeness has nothing to do with revenue sharing at the university level. And so the university's p &L won't change at all. This is just the ability for student athletes to go and monetize their name, image, and likeness and their ability to make money while in college. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the final thing that I have for you is where, where do you go from here? You've been, you've been helping athletes for the last couple decades trying to get this thing started. It is now started. Where do you personally go from here? I don't know, maybe to the bar tonight to take a shot at tequila to celebrate this moment. I mean, this is a big milestone in this fight, you know, and so I think it's worth celebrating and, you know, it wasn't just me. It takes a village to get here. You know, Ed O'Bannon played a, played a big role in, in here. All the student athletes who have been speaking up against the NCAA. But, the, but it turns out the people that are most responsible for this are the state legislators that started in California. The states just said enough. Like, we're going to take this into our own hands. Our athletes in the state of California are going to be able to own their own name, image, and likeness. And then that cascaded throughout the entire country. Now we're 10 states just in a few weeks will allow student athletes to own their own name. It's a big moment um, in the history of college athletics. And July 1st, I, I believe, will be the biggest day uh, to ever come to college athletics. 
uh, and the biggest change. So a lot to be thankful for. All right. Anything else you want to mention uh, for us on, on our end? Yeah, there's um, we did a great documentary called called College Sports Inc. on Vice TV. Uh, it's non-gated. You can Google it. Anyone can watch it. It came out two weeks ago. It's a, it's a fantastic story of how we got here and why. Um, and, and talks to a lot of student athletes and a lot of universities, a lot of state senators and, and, and federal senators. And it's a great doc.